Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's theCUBE. Covering Knowledge 15. Brought to you by ServiceNow. Okay, welcome back everyone. You are watching theCUBE here live in Las Vegas for ServiceNow Knowledge 15, hashtag No15. Um, this is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events in the District of Sydney, Illinois. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. Joined by Coach Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.com. Our next guest we're excited to have is the founder, Chief Product Officer of ServiceNow, Fred Luddy. Welcome back to theCUBE, great to see you. So great to be here again, thanks. See you uh, all jacked up from the keynote, great keynote, um, story of the beginning of ServiceNow and the next 10 years. How do you feel? I feel ready for the next 10 years. <laughs> you know, we, uh, we spent 10 years building something that I think has established a really great foundation. And now, you know, the, the people just want to work differently. They have different expectations based on what they do in their real life that I should be able to work in real time. I should be able to communicate very quickly. I should know at a glance looking at my wrist or looking at the thing I pulled out of my pocket whether I've got something to do or not and I just want to go on about my day. And I think this, this is our first step into that whole real-time system. It's exciting for me as an entrepreneur, Dave as well as an entrepreneur, to look at what you guys have done. Really, as an entrepreneur, congratulations. You know, Having the ability to build something from scratch, grow it, realize you want to write code every day, hire Frank Salutman, build a great company. Now you have developers, 1,600 plus developers coming in for CreatorCon. Great traction, happy customers. Um, What's the next vision? I mean, I mean, keeping people happy, um, where do you go from here? What's the path from the product? Is it cloud native? Is it enterprise grade? How, do you, how, do you, how are you dealing with all this now internally? Now that you're leading the charge on the product side, what's the path? Well, I think we've pretty much set the stage today for what's going to play out over the next five to 10 years. But for me, so this whole game has never been about money, it's always been about popularity, right? I always, I always wanted my art on your refrigerator kind of thing. <laughs> and um, so what we would love to do is we would love for everybody in all walks of life to think about service now as a place where they would go to get work done. So rather than using uh, yellow sticky notes or rather than using texting, everybody at work would be using, for whatever kind of tasking they're doing, they would be using ServiceNow to say, here's my list of to-dos, I'm going to give this to that person, this to that person, I'm going to communicate that this is going to be late. All of that stuff should be done to, with a beautiful touch interface, all handled in real time. And for it to work, it has to, it has to be easier than not using it, right? And so that, I think that's the big trick with technology. With, with systems of record, things like, things like SAP, management can, can, can say, you must do this because you have to adhere to our policy, you have to adhere to our process, you have to stay within the boundaries of, uh, uh, of the policy that's been established. But when you start to move out beyond uh, that ring to where people are doing personal things during their day, then it really has to become simple. And I think you saw with the uh, interface that we had on, the, on, on mobile and on the watch that it is really becoming easier you know, make a note, I got to do this, I got to do this thing very quickly. You can do that right on your watch with Siri now. So Fred, I learned a lot in your keynote today. I knew you were a chief product officer. I didn't know you were a booth babe. Yeah. I did not know that. I didn't know, I knew you were a former CEO. I didn't know you were a pretending CEO. I didn't know you sat in a cubicle. That was news to me. And then you also made Frank Slubin blush, which I thought was very good. Well, um, that's always, a, you know, to get a Dutch person to blush, <laughs> that's no small challenge. So I think that was probably the most interesting thing. It was great. So I want to ask you, so you so, showed this beautiful software today. You, you, you took us down memory lane um, and you showed us some of the previous instantiations of ServiceNow and other software. We use software in our business and we use you know, HR portals and, and things like that and it feels old. But your software that you showed today is not looking old, it's looking modern. <clears throat> so how is it that you're able to sort of put that modern look, feel, and then all that real-timeness into your platform but other software just doesn't feel that way. I don't, uh, or that's maybe putting lipstick on a pig in the old, you know the other software example. Uh, how are you able to do that, and how real is that? Well, it's very real. Um, 
there, there's a few things in this journey. First of all, we have been uh, justly accused of putting lipstick on a pig with a couple of our releases, you know, the, the UI stuff that we thought was super cool, in fact, just looked mildly better. But we started a transformation just about two and a half years ago that led up to what everything you saw today. And we also, we had to fundamentally invert our architecture and create a new way of getting information to the user rather than having the user constantly look for information. And I, I think if you read The Innovator's Dilemma or if you study large software companies, they almost never have the spine to actually go and do something new. And so they, they tend to just, you know, improve one or two percent every couple of years. And, but unfortunately, the market's expectations are moving 10 to 20 percent a year. So their one to two percent just means it looks worse every year. And uh, so they, you know, this year's software looks a little less worse than last year's. So I think if you look at companies like, like Google, when I met with Ben Freed, who's the uh, CIO at Google, he asked me, how many lines of code from the original release of service now do you still have? And I said, you know, probably 30, 40%. He said, you know what it is at Google? We know exactly, it's zero. We have rewritten every line of code that is the Google search engine. And Apple, you know, when they, they, they switched from the Motorola chip to the Intel chip, they switched out operating systems when, when, when jobs came back, right? And they, they switched out the, the BSD operating system for the next based operating system, and they switched chipsets. They have had, and I think Tim Cook said this in an interview recently, they, they have had the guts to walk away from what was a good idea but now is a bad idea. And I think few technology companies have those guts. So we've talked about HTML5 in previous knowledge. Is it, was HTML5 a stepping stone or was that sort of <laughs> part of the evolution? Throw away and redo. No, that HTML5 is, is absolutely core to the, to the platform's success. What was, what was really holding us back and probably holding back a lot of other vendors is that in, in a lot of corporations, they're still using um, IE7, and in some places even IE6. Now yeah. thankfully, Microsoft has finally shut that off because the only thing that gets the corporations to move is to declare that you have a security bug that will not be fixed, <laughs> right? And then they move finally, overnight. Yeah. <laughs> Other than that, they take several years to move. But HTML5 is, is, is absolutely fundamental to us on the desktop, right? We, we, we can do things in HTML5 and Angular and Bootstrap that years ago people never dreamt could be done on a desktop. And um, on the mobile platform though, there, you know, we, we, have, uh, we have a hybrid app, but it's largely, largely native. You know, the, the, the largest percentage of it is native. But the opening scenario where I brought the mobile app up, we were actually running our new service portal, which is an HTML5 app, Angular Bootstrap, inside our native app. And the native app gave us a layer to get back to the camera, gave it barcode, gave us geo, those sorts of things. So we're using, we're using it to, to get device capabilities, but we have to remember that a large percentage of our customer base will never install our app because they don't use it that frequently. You know, it's just like when you, you go to, you know, you go to Denny's once, right? And they want you to install the Denny's app. I don't really think I need the <laughs> Denny's app. You know, I'm, I'm pretty good the way I am. <laughs> right? So there are certain things you're going to continue Love to do American on the website. There. <laughs> oh, do you still have it? No, it's, it's I, awesome. just the, I just get the eggs and bacon. Yeah. Um, I got to ask you about the cloud because one of the things that you mentioned about having the spine to do something new kind of has a mindset of the old days because you could be wrong and be in a cul-de-sac of you know, writing code and then not have any good software or, or use cases. Um, but with the cloud, you can do things much faster. Iteration, we hear that here all the time in ServiceNow. Iteration, fast, agile, that's a cloud theme. So Amazon has shown that you can do a lot of releases. As the product person, do you have that same mindset in your organization and is that part of the plan is to continue to push out new stuff in that kind of cloud, agile way? Yeah, we, um, we throttled back on the number of releases that we come out with uh, every year. And um, we've, we're now just, we've gone to a new methodology for even developing our software so that we can move more things more quickly. You know, we have a large number of developers now who are working on a large number of, of offerings. And so somehow we have to figure out how they can all work together without stepping on each other. And we put together an iteration for that. So, 
you know, agile is, is part and parcel to, to who we are. I, I think we, we, have a, we have a huge positive step that we could make and that we're going to make, but we haven't made it yet. So everything is a service. I mean, we were just at Amazon Summit in San Francisco. They talked about machine learning as a service. First time we've seen that kind of trend, which is awesome. They got some canned machine learning, but that's the kind of trend we're seeing. Everything is a service going on. So what do you have now that's, what is everything today and what's going to be everything in the future? What do you see coming around the corner? And also you said, you know, this microservices is a hot buzzword in Silicon Valley right now. That's more app specific, but you got a set of services today everything means there'll be more, right? And everything will be a service. What is coming around the corner that's going to be added on to service now that you can envision that you could share with us? Well, I think one of my big drives is I, I really hate email. And there's an MIT study that shows that people spend 36% of their workday in their inbox, which means that's 36 and most of that is probably deleting emails. Only 22% only of emails that get sent actually get read in their entirety. And what I'm trying to do, what, what we're trying to do, what our, what our thrust is, is to try to change the communication medium for asking someone to do something so that we can, we can have all these services that you can discover easily in a catalog. So this everything is a service is a big deal to us. What happens though is now that everything is a service, that's going to build a huge database. So I'm going to want to have things like machine learning coming in to analyze what I do inside my business. Also. The, you know, the Internet of Things is still not yet a big player for us, but imagine if, if, if the things inside the corporation all start to communicate with each other and they all funnel back to a system like ServiceNow. When, you, when we do things, right now we have SNMP agents on servers that tell us when the server's overheating. Well, if you work at Kroger, it's more important that you know that the deli case is not refrigerating, right? Because you are losing stock right then. And so the whole notion that you have an internet of things where point of sale terminals, where, where deli cases are, are reporting back to you and then you're handling that in real time, that becomes These very are new workflows. Well. These are new workflows. They're, they're brand new workflows and they're, they're, they're really, I mean, it's, it's, a very, it's a very exciting time. So I wonder if we can talk about, keep on that innovation theme. We were just at MIT, or in London, with the MIT professors, Eric Brynjolfsson and Andy McAfee. Yeah, live a good they, life. They wrote the book, yeah, we, we travel a lot, but you know, we work hard. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we talk to a lot of smart people. Right? So we're hanging out with those guys, they make us feel smarter, you know? They told us that we, they made, we made them feel cool. But anyway, okay. I guess that was the compliment. So, but the whole concept was, you know, we've lived off of Moore's Law, exponential growth for the last, you know, whatever, many decades. And the future of exponential growth is going to come from combining technologies. And the one piece of their research that showed is we used to replace humans, you know, with labor. Uh, 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 machines would replace human labor. Now it's cognitive. And you guys are doing a lot of that. You're doing a lot of, you know, cutting out a lot of the waste. So, but the premise is that innovation will come from combinations of technologies, that the constraint to growth is going to be the ability to envision these combinations and mm -hmm. apply them in a business. So what are the combinations of tech, first of all, if you buy that premise, you may not, but what are the combinations that you see in the future? I think, I think that premise is correct. And so if you think about the Internet of Things, um, now I'll get, I'm going to answer the question. But you think about the Internet of Things, people think, oh, I need to put a, you know, an IP address on my light bulb so I can turn it off. That's not what's really going to drive everything. What's going to drive everything is rethinking how we've done things because we've been constrained where things couldn't communicate. So let me give you an example. Nest, yeah. right? Completely rethought the thermostat, yeah. right? We've had programmable thermostats now for a quarter century and nobody's ever programmed one because they're impossible. And I don't know when I'm going to be here. Nest rethought that whole notion. So I think the combination of things, you know, you have an intelligent, we have a number of different things in that Nest device that are figuring out when people are in the room, when they're out of the room, when the temperature should go up and temperature should go down. Those sorts of things are gonna, gonna happen a lot. And so a lot of rethinking is gonna have to occur. And, and combining different technologies um, is going, is, is what's going to bring it all together. But fundamentally, and then to get to involve things like Watson, then it all has to come back to a central source. And this goes all the way from, from the most mundane thing like adjusting the temperature in your room all the way to cancer treatment, right? So cancer treatment is another thing that there's a lot of 
There's more, I think there's more progress being made in cancer treatment right now than has been made in the last 150 years we've been fighting the disease. Because, because the combination of these things, you know, the, the, the Illumina X10 machine, being able to sequence, share, being able to share that data around, around the world, and then to have big enough machines that we can actually analyze molecular structure and environmental molecular structure is actually leading people to discover how cancer really works. And if we can, we can figure out how cancer works, now we can do something else really cool. We can take T cells out of our body, we can instruct them how to kill those cancer cells, and we can re-inject them, and all of a sudden our body is killing our cancer rather than chemo, radio, or, or And you'll need surgery. humans to figure a lot of that stuff out, but Dr. Watson might be there to help us diagnose cancer more quickly, or maybe Well, yes, but the, but the humans have to tell them what to look right. for, right? <laughs> I, I think that's, that, you know, the... Um, we, we flew back and forth over Cuba during the, during the Bay of Pigs to try to figure out what was going on, and it was finally one intelligence guy said, um, the Russians are there, how do you know? Because there's soccer fields in Cuba. Well, yeah, Cubans, they play baseball. Russians play soccer. If they're so they, couldn't find, they couldn't find any military equipment, but they found soccer fields. Right? So it doesn't make any difference. Uh, you know, you can have very intelligent machines, but, but human cognitive ability is, is, is n never going to be approached. I and mean, playing Jeopardy is very different than noticing yeah. A soccer field being an anomalous so, thing. So, so, so expand on that concept of the innovation piece, the enabler. What is the, the disruptive enabler or ERS in that model? Is it analytics? Is it the real time? Because you got to kind of see it, you got to understand it, and if you can have supplemental, you know, prescriptive or predictive analytics. Yeah. So this whole notion of bioinformatics and data science is probably going to be a frontier that's going to play out for the next, I'm going to guess, 10 to 20 years, right? Because right now you've got You've got this, you know, you get all these genome sequences and you've got these people at the top that they've been studying cancer now for 150 years by injecting bacteria into little petri dishes and seeing if it turns yellow or green. Somehow those two have to meet in the middle and that's where the bioinformaticians are. You also have people who are very good, you know, a mind like Jack Welch's or Elon Musk's, very good at analyzing uh, patterns, et cetera, but somebody has to mine all this data down here to bring the pattern up and those are the data scientists. So it's going to be, a, I think, a great era of discovery, a combination of machine learning plus, um, plus, plus you know, direction and, and the ability to, to play with that data. You know, it's, it's a very minority of report kind of thing. You know, <laughs> yeah. you do have to kind of know what you're looking for. And when you see something anomalous in one area, you want to look for something anomalous in another area and then try to bring those things together. Okay, so if you were an entrepreneur today, forget that you work at ServiceNow, that you were, say, unemployed back where you were and you wanted to work on a startup, uh, there's a lot of innovation, you, you highlighted things are upside down now, new capabilities are enabling, new use cases, new workflows, new opportunities. What, what, what would you do, what would your advice be for folks out there, whether they're entrepreneurs or folks inside businesses who now have shoulders to stand on with things like ServiceNow platform, open source, there's a lot of cool things that can be done fast. Um, what would you work on and what advice would you give folks out there who are creating, I mean, you've got 1,600 developers here and that's going to grow and, it, <laughs> yeah, that, that's a kind of hard question to ask, uh, answer. Um, I think, for me, the, the, the opportunity in, in healthcare is absolutely enormous. I mean, we have one-sixth of our economy, our entire economy, trying to keep people healthy. And the number of inefficiencies in the healthcare system are absolutely staggering. So there's, there's a front end. Like, Let's drive out the inefficiencies in healthcare. And p things like open source or the ServiceNow platform could definitely help in that area. And then there's a whole other area of healthcare, which is, which is really about disease discovery and treatment, right? That that's, and that's a, that's a big data, data science, bioinformatics uh, area that's going to be, again, growing for the next, uh, for the foreseeable future. So healthcare is a big, big deal for me. I, I just, I really think that there's, there's great, opportunity there to really make a difference yeah. to not only just you know make a great business and save money but uh, but you also could then really help the economy or you could build tinder yeah yeah so back on that point you wrote that memo I love your comment about <laughs> countering the, the VC Sequoia memo the uh, you know the end is near her memo I remember that down. very clearly yeah, sure. um, you guys countered that look at it as an opportunity. Um, what's your take on the current craze of valuations? I mean, I just saw Docker got another 95 million, Illumio got 100 million, they've been around for two years. Is that toxic? Is that a way to build a company? You built a successful company, um, I think the right way. I mean, you built a product, sold it, built, got financing, grew it. 
Is that a sustainable, is that just more consumer category? And is that kind of toxic in the enterprise? Is that viable or is this a new capability we haven't seen? Thoughts well, on that? <laughs> I, I do look at some of the valuations with just general bewilderment because especially in the business to consumer side where the valuations get so high so fast because you wonder if any of this stuff is going to last, right? I mean, what would be the valuation of Friendster right now or MySpace if there was no Facebook and, and yet who remembers those, those properties today, right? So it's, it's quite a race that goes on and, and whether or not they become sustaining like Facebook has or like Google has is a pretty big bet. So do, do I think the valuations are pretty high? You know, time will tell. Yeah. But in general, I think, I think yes. Uh, I think what you see though with valuations is it, it, that's a five to 10 year game. We've only been public now for just about three years, right? And, 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 and our, our business has continued, it's, it's up into the right march. And we've also then expanded and, and opened other markets. So whether other companies can do that, I have, I have no idea. The whole notion of yeah. Docker, the whole, I mean, it seems like a great notion for me until something comes along that replaces it. I mean, it, at some point, there were people that were manufacturing DVDs that were laughing at the guys that had floppy disks, <laughs> right? Yeah. And now they're both sitting yeah. somewhere in a bar wondering what happened. What's your take on um, developers? I mean, inside the company, what's the coolest thing you've seen inside one of your customer innovation uh, uh, examples that uh, you've seen? And two, what are you excited about as from a technology standpoint? What's, what's getting you jazzed up right now and motivated every day? And, so talk about those things. Customers, uh, success stories that are, that are sexy and cool, and some stuff that gets you jazzed up. I think the, the, most, the most innovative thing I've seen on ServiceNow, maybe in, in the history of ServiceNow, is definitely the KPMG onboarding app. I mean, w and, and it's a great model. They, um, they, they took a very, very complex process, which many CIOs have told me is their number one challenge, getting people to work quickly, right? They're, they're on the payroll starting Monday morning, eight o'clock. When are they productive, right? That, t that, that clock is ticking and the registers and they, the meter's running. So they, they did something, they took a very complex process and, and really made it simple for all parties concerned and all on mobile devices, right? So one thing that's great about that is when the, when the employee starts, they think, I work for a cool place, right? Look at this awesome app they gave me a week before to track what I'm going to do and go and et cetera, et cetera. Right now, our big challenge, and I think the thing that we are most excited and intrigued about, because we don't yet have an answer for this, is what are the things that we're going to be able to do on the phone and on the tablet and on the watch that we can't even do on the desktop, right? So when, when you first got the phone and you were able to you know, move maps and take a look at pictures and rearrange things, you thought, I can't even do this on a desktop at all. Right, and so we're, we're looking for ways that are relevant to our customers, not cool for the sake of being cool, yeah. but value cool. What, what, is our, what do our customers, management and day-to-day and, 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 and -day workers want to do on a phone that they can't do on a desktop because they don't have that tactile capability? So where are you getting inspiration these days? We've talked on theCUBE before about Amazon, that Amazon-like experience. We've heard Uber a lot at this event. Um, Open Table is another example mm -hmm. we've heard, you know, new, newer examples. Where are you getting, as a software developer, your inspiration these days? Well, we, we get it from pretty much everywhere. You know, it, it doesn't even have to be technology, right? You might see something that's not technology that's, that's pretty cool and you think, wow, I could, I could make that work for my product too. Um, but it's really on two fronts. We, we do watch the business to consumer front a lot because a lot of cool innovations are happening there. We watch the pure technology stack, you know, what's, what's going on with Angular, what's going on with Ember, what's going on with Backbone, we, you know, what's, what's going on with Twitter Bootstrap, you know, 4, that sort of thing, if there is going to be a 4. And then um, we really listen to our customers, and our customers uh, sometimes give us great ideas and sometimes express great pain points that they just wish could be eliminated. And that's really been the, uh, the backbone of, of product management at our company, is listening to the customers. We put out a couple of releases, uh, uh, we put out a couple of applications that probably weren't written to customer expectations, <laughs> and man, did we get good feedback. Bill how, Gates fast, was, how fast is that feedback coming? <laughs> <laughs> <It's an instant laughs> As Bill Gates said, you learn the most from your most disappointed customer. So, uh, True. you know, I think you know the customer base will always be able to tell us, I think you could do this better. This is a little confusing. And oh, you're having a lot of fun. Did you name the company Glidesoft? 
I did. It was, was your name. I was, saw your wife like belly laughing at that. <laughs> if I can get my <laughs> wife funny. to laugh, I'm a happy guy. <laughs> well, it seems like you're having a lot of fun, Fred. So it's a, it is a great, great so, time. Fred, take the time to share with the folks who are watching uh, or will watch on demand after. What's the vibe of the show? Share your perspective as the founder. Obviously, you know, proud. Uh, great success you guys have done. What's the vibe? What's the what's going on in the hallways? What's some of the conversations you've had over dinner? Um, what's the focus? What surprised you? Maybe uh, some some highlights. Share with us your take on the show. Okay, so here's what surprised me. I, w I was going to do a, a great stunt at first, and I was going to knock the laptop off the podium accidentally. They figured it out in about four picoseconds. Right? I thought I thought they're going to everybody was going to be shocked and stunned. <laughs> so that that's the one thing that surprised me. But the the, the reason that we all come together here is, number one, people that work in this technology area, they work a lot. And I think the chance for to get together and uh, commiserate, you know, yeah. to, to try to find different solutions to different problems, find out what other people are doing, find out I'm not the only person that has this issue, that's a wonderful thing. And then lots and lots of ideas are just flowing constantly here. and. Um, you know, I, I had meeting after meeting after meeting where people said, what's new in the UI, what's new in the UI, what's new in the UI? So I was happy that I finally got to present what's new in the UI this morning. Awesome, and it's you guys good. are such, so successful and you make great software, I was very impressed. Um, you've been the trend to Angular, Node, all the stuff you guys are bootstrap. You're enabling a lot of developers, you've got the, the sellout with the developers. Oh, I hope, they, I hope they figured that out because we have created oceans of opportunity mm -hmm. now for people that have they they not they, they'll have they'll have uh, industry standard de facto standard backgrounds in these technologies, but also they can go to places like Bootsnip and just grab some CSS in about ten minutes and create a new yeah. looking UI for tagging or something whatever they need to be doing, and uh, you know all the directives that have been written in Angular that they can now pick up on and just import. Yeah, we yeah. have created an ocean of opportunity for people at all levels. Well, take that to the next step. Share to the developers directly right now, what, you know, what's, why ServiceNow, why you guys are so excited, and they look to you, you've been there, done that, you built a company now, your chief product officer, share with them why they should be developing on ServiceNow uh, and joining CreatorCon, and, and I'm sure you're going to have a very successful developer program, and we'll be having conferences just on developers. <laughs> right, well, you know, I, I think because with all technologies, when, when you choose something to build in, you should choose the most appropriate technology for the task at hand. So if somebody's doing, you know, if somebody's doing drug discovery, you wouldn't choose ServiceNow. But for so many things in so many businesses that want to be automated, that want to be streamlined, where you want to cut corners, you want to get to the outcome quicker, ServiceNow is a perfect platform. And I think for, for, for six or seven years, we didn't even talk about, plat the word platform never came out of our mouths, even mm -hmm. though that was the initial idea for the company. And now, we're out of the closet. We're platform player, right? We've got platform development at, at several different levels. And I think what was done uh, this year to create the store where you can make money building things, or you can get real feedback. When people give you feedback and they haven't paid you anything, it has one, one set of values. If they've paid you something and they give you feedback, it has a much higher value. So we've got the store, we've got the new developer studio, uh, we've, we're, we've, we've built the portal based on you know, de facto standards. I think that the, the opportunity ahead is going to be an order of magnitude higher than it has been over the last eight or nine years. Creating value is the new happiness, you know, and that's you know, getting home, whether that's getting home early or creating profit for the company, building heroes. They won't go home earlier, <laughs> but they'll get more done in the same period of time. Faster time to beer, as we always say in the developer community. Well, this is theCUBE. We are watching live here in Las Vegas with ServiceNow's Knowledge15. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.